Here is the story of Esther from the Bible, along with lessons from the story. In the ancient Persian Empire, which stretched across 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia, King Xerxes reigned from his royal citadel in the capital city of Susa. In the third year of his rule around 483 BC, he threw an extravagant party that lasted 180 days. The celebration was meant to display the unfathomable riches and glory of the Persian. Kingdom to all the nobles, princes, military leaders, and officials from every province. When those 180 days of feasting had run their course, King Xerxes commanded his beautiful wife, Queen Vashti, to appear before him and his guests adorned only in her royal crown. He wanted to parade her beauty before the masses of partygoers who were drunken with the fine wines that had flowed freely. But Vashti refused to obey the king's order, likely out of a sense of modesty and dignity befitting her royal status. Xerxes was furious at this act of defiance. Seeking counsel, his wise advisors warned that Vashti's disobedience could incite a spirit of disrespect among women throughout the kingdom to likewise defy their husbands. So the king made the rash decision to banish Vashti from his presence forever, stripping her of her royal position. To find a new queen from among the beautiful young virgins in the Persian lands, a search was undertaken across all 127 provinces. In the capital city lived a Jewish man named Mordecai, who had been among the exiles from Jerusalem taken captive by the Babylonians. Along with many Jews, Mordecai remained in Persia after Babylon's defeat. Mordecai had been raised by his uncle and aunt, and upon their death he took in their orphaned daughter Hadassah, whose name he changed to Esther. Now a beautiful young woman, Esther was among the many maidens gathered to the palace to undergo twelve months of beauty treatments before being presented to King Xerxes. Mordecai cautioned his cousin Esther not to reveal her Jewish heritage, so she followed his advice carefully. Esther was taken into the royal harem to be prepared under the care of Hegai, the eunuch in charge of the king's concubines. Esther soon won the favor of Hegai, who was struck by her exquisite beauty and pleasant spirit. He provided her with the finest beauty treatments and gave her seven select maidens to serve her as well. After the full year of preparation, each virgin would take her turn spending one night with the king. When Esther's turn finally came, Xerxes was immediately captivated by her radiant loveliness and gentle charm. In his eyes, no other young woman even came close to comparing. With this humble Jewish orphan from the minority captive population, to his delight, the king fell deeply in love with Esther and chose her as his new queen, the envy of every other maiden. Still, Esther kept her Jewish identity secret as instructed by Mordecai, who himself had taken up a position as a lowly gatekeeper in the king's court, better enabling him to remain aware of any threats concerning the Jewish people. And it wasn't long before Mordecai indeed uncovered a sinister plot by two of the king's personal eunuch attendants, Bigthan and Teresh, to assassinate Xerxes. Mordecai hurriedly reported their treacherous scheme to Queen Esther, who in turn relayed the vital information to her husband, the king. After an investigation revealed the chilling truth, the two eunuchs were apprehended and swiftly executed for their attempted regicide. Mordecai's heroic deed in foiling the deadly conspiracy against the king's life was recorded in the official royal chronicles. Several years later, King Xerxes bestowed the highest position in his court upon a vain and scathingly arrogant official named Haman the Agagite. Haman quickly became corrupted by the immense power and took petty delight in having all the servants and subjects of the palace bow down to him in abject honor. Mordecai, however, refused to participate in any act of idol worship or reverence toward Haman or indeed any man besides his king. When Haman noticed Mordecai's stubborn resistance, he became enraged with bitter loathing, not just toward Mordecai alone, but toward all the Jewish people Mordecai represented. Haman's hatred soon metastasized into an evil genocidal scheme to annihilate every last Jew throughout the vast Persian Empire. The wicked Haman began weaving his devious plot by casting pur or lots to choose the most auspicious day for this mass execution. Once the date was set, he appeared before King Xerxes to denounce the Jews as an inferior people who threatened the well-being of the kingdom by keeping themselves separate with their own strange customs and laws. There is a certain people scattered among the provinces whose laws differ from everyone else, Haman declared with cunning deception. They do not obey the king's laws, so it is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. He offered to pour an immense sum of silver into the royal treasury in exchange for an edict to exterminate these undesirables. 
Having no idea, Haman secretly spoke of his own beloved wife and her people, the naive. King rashly caved to Haman's manipulative denunciations. Xerxes promptly removed his royal signet ring and handed it to Haman, giving the despicable man free reign to issue any decree he wished, sealed with the king's own irrevocable authority. Immediately, Haman's officials were summoned, and they drafted an edict calling for the complete genocide of the Jews on the 13th day of the month Adar, less than a year away. Copies of this monstrous decree were dispatched by couriers to all 127 provinces of the kingdom to announce the intended slaughter, plunder, and destruction of every man, woman, and child of Jewish descent. When the horrifying news reached Mordecai, he tore his garments and covered, himself in sackcloth and ashes, wailing loudly and mourning throughout the streets of the capital. Jews across the provinces responded with fasting, weeping, and lamenting this impending genocide. Esther's servants informed her of Mordecai's deep grieving over this death, sentence upon his people. She quickly summoned Mordecai, who explained, the evil scheme devised by the wicked Haman, he pleaded with the queen to go before King Xerxes and beg for mercy and protection for her people. But Esther pointed out the extreme danger of such an act. Anyone who approached, the king uninvited in his inner court could be executed on the spot unless he extended his golden scepter allowing them to live. And Xerxes had not summoned Esther to his presence for 30 days, so intervening was an enormous risk she dared not take lightly. Mordecai knew the stakes but implored Esther not to remain passive and silent. In this desperate hour for the sake of self-preservation, he issued her this solemn warning. Do not think that because you are in the king's palace, you alone will escape. If you insist on remaining silent at a time like this, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your family will be annihilated. Perhaps you have been elevated to your royal position for such a time as this? Recognizing the gravity of the moment, Esther told Mordecai to have all the Jews in the capital city gathered together to fast for three days without food or water at the end of which she would risk everything to approach the king. If she perished, so be it. Mordecai quickly relayed the instructions to the Jews in Susa, who joined in fasting, and praying for Esther's seemingly impossible mission. On the third day, Esther bathed, perfumed herself, and donned her finest royal robes. Taking a deep breath and mustering her courage, she made her way through the palace, court toward the inner hall where the king held his throne. As she approached the doorway unannounced, Xerxes looked up and saw her standing there in violation of protocols. Several tense moments passed as Esther stood trembling with her life in the balance. Then, seeing the pleasing expression on her lovely face, the king smiled and extended, his golden scepter sparing her life. What is it, Queen Esther? He asked gently. What is your request? I will give you whatever you ask, up to half of my kingdom. Esther responded wisely, merely requesting that the king and Haman attend a private banquet she would prepare for them. Xerxes consented to her peculiar petition, unsuspecting of her true motives or hidden nationality. When the banquet commenced, the king again asked Esther what request she desired, of him up to half his kingdom. But the brave queen remained coy, asking only that the king and Haman return the following evening for another private banquet, and she would reveal her petition. Once more, Xerxes was confounded by his wife's actions, but agreed to her wish. That same night, the king's sleep was disrupted, so he commanded his servants to read, allowed the official chronicles of his reign to put him into slumber, as the records recounted Mordecai's earlier loyalty in exposing the assassination plot by the treacherous eunuchs. Xerxes was struck by the fact that the noble Jew had never received any reward or honor for his service. Meanwhile, by a cruel twist of fate, the egomaniacal Haman had arrived in the palace courtyard at that late hour on his way to request execution orders for Mordecai before their gallows could be constructed. But seeing Haman idling outside, the king summoned him to ask, what should be done for the man? The king desires to honor. Having no clue the subject was his own Jewish nemesis rather than himself, Haman's pride caused him to suggest the most lavish recognition. For the man, the king wishes to honor, proposed Haman, have the royal robe delivered along, with a horse the king himself has ridden, its head adorned with a royal crest. Then, have one of the highest-ranking nobles array this man and publicly parade him, through the city streets, calling out before him, This is what is done for the man! The king wishes to honor! The smug Haman confidently awaited this supreme distinction to be bestowed upon himself. 
But King Xerxes shockingly commanded, Excellent idea, now go. Get the robe and the horse and do everything exactly as you proposed for Mordecai, the Jew who sits by the king's gate. See that you leave nothing undone. Haman was utterly mortified to realize his suggested honors were destined not for himself, but for Mordecai, the loathsome Jew he so virulently despised. With a shattered ego, he had no choice but to obey the king by leading the royal steed. Laden with Mordecai and the sumptuous robes while calling out the words of honor throughout the capital streets. When the humiliating procession ended, Mordecai returned to his duties by the king's gate while Haman rushed home in disgrace, covering his face and avoiding eye contact. After relaying his shameful mistreatment to his wife and advisors, Haman hastily returned to the second banquet hosted by Queen Esther, where the king again pressed her for the special petition she desired. This time, Esther finally revealed how she and her people, the Jews, had been condemned to genocide by Haman's hateful decree. We have been sold to be annihilated, killed and destroyed, she cried before the king. Enraged by such treachery, plotted by his own trusted official, Xerxes stormed out into the palace gardens to contemplate this unspeakable betrayal. In his absence, Haman fell before Esther's feet, pleading for his life, only to return and find the wicked man asking for forgiveness at the feet of Queen Esther. The king's sudden violent jealousy. Will you even attempt to seduce the queen in my very own palace before my eyes? Xerxes erupted. Guards swiftly drag him out on the king's command. One of the eunuchs pointed out the 75-foot gallows Haman had erected in his courtyard to hang Mordecai, without needing to ponder the manner of justice. Xerxes decreed, hang him on it! Once again, Mordecai's life was spared by divine providence as the evil Haman met the grim fate he had intended for the Jew to further undo the wicked. Decree against his people, Queen Esther fell at her husband's feet, weeping, to beg for the Jewish lives to be preserved. Seeing her deep sincerity, Xerxes extended his golden scepter, assuring Esther that she and Mordecai had permission to counteract Haman's edict with a new one that would allow the Jews to defend themselves against any violent assault on the appointed day throughout the kingdom. And the king granted Mordecai all of Haman's vast estate and riches, promoting him to the high position vacated by the disgraced perpetrator of the evil pogrom. In the following days, Mordecai worked swiftly with Esther and the king's scribes to pen a new edict that empowered the Jews in each of the 127 provinces to protect themselves against any armed militia attempting to slaughter them. The decree was dispatched with the same urgency as Haman's original orders to ensure the e Jews would be ready to resist any genocidal attacks. As the fateful 13th of Adar approached, the Jews across the kingdom united to turn Haman's scheme against their pagan adversaries, though vastly outnumbered, the Jewish people arose in self-defense to overwhelm their would-be executioners, slaying over 75,000 of those who sought their destruction. Among the dead were the ten sons of wicked Haman. In the capital of Susa alone, Mordecai reported to Queen Esther that 500 dogs of their enemies had been killed, with the ten sons of Haman hanging among them. Still, a few ardent anti-Semites remained defiant. So Esther begged Xerxes to allow the Jews to take up arms the following day to fully secure their safety and survival. When the king consented, the Jews and the capital slew another 300 of those still, intent on annihilating them. No longer facing genocide, the victorious Jews finally celebrated their deliverance with joyous feasting that echoed across the provinces. Mordecai and Esther jointly sent letters to all the Jews throughout the Persian lands to commemorate this miraculous victory over their enemies. They instituted the annual festival of Purim on the 14th and 15th of Adar to honor these momentous events through perpetual remembrance and rejoicing for generations to come. The descendants of Persia's Jewish population continue observing Purim. To this very day, nearly 2,500 years after Esther's heroism, the name Purim means lots and refers to the Pur Haman maliciously, cast to initiate his plot against the Jews. To celebrate their deliverance, observers participate in public readings of the Book of Esther and joyously exchanged gifts of food and donations to the poor. It became customary to host festive Purim meals, perform comedy, plays and parodies recounting the story, dress up in costumes, and make excessive noise with graggers or noisemakers whenever Haman's name is mentioned. During communal readings of Esther's scroll, the festival serves as an annual reminder that even when the power of evil seems devastating, God is faithfully working in hidden ways to preserve his people. It commemorates how an unlikely hero, an orphaned Jewish, 
woman guided by her wise cousin, risked everything out of devoted courage to rescue her nation from total annihilation at the hands of a narcissistic perpetrator of genocide. In the end, Queen Esther's bold obedience rooted in supernatural strength, derived from prayer, fasting, and trust in the providence of God, exposed Haman's sinister schemes and thwarted the evil decree. Her inspirational example of rising to her challenging circumstances against all odds turned mourning into gladness and the Jews' devastation into a joyous celebration still honored today.